Today, I'm gonna to share with you three progressively more disturbing stories, and at the end of each of them, I will share the photo or photos that are famously associated with them. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to house sit for the like button, and while you're there, split all of their two-ply toilet paper into one ply. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1992, 41-year-old Marvin Hemeyer purchased a plot of land in the small town of Granby, Colorado. There, for the next decade, he would run a muffler shop. Then, in the early 2000s, a cement company approached him and asked if they could buy a portion of his land so they could build a plant. And at first, Marvin was not really interested in the idea, but the cement company was offering a lot of money. And so Marvin came around to the idea, and after a long negotiation, Marvin and this company were about to sign a contract when Granby Zoning Commission informed the cement company they didn't need to buy Marvin's property in order to build this plant. They could actually build it right next to Marvin's property. The cement company was thrilled. Marvin was furious. Not only was he losing a ton of money with this deal falling through, but also he used to use that plot of land that sat next to his property as a cut through between his house and his muffler shop. Marvin immediately began petitioning the town to try to stop the construction of this plant, but he was repeatedly rejected. And within a year, the plant was built right Right next to Marvin's property. A couple of years later, on the afternoon of June 4th, 2004, Granby residents heard a very loud sound that almost sounded like thunder coming from somewhere in the town. And so they ran outside to see what it was. When they looked down the road, they saw it. It was a fully armored bulldozer coming right down the center of town. The sides, the top, the back, the front, the whole thing was completely encased in steel sheets. And in some parts, the steel was over a foot thick. Traveling at four miles an hour, it's treads were enormous, and as it went over the road, it was taking huge bites out of the ground. There was no way to tell who was actually driving this bulldozer because there were no windows. And in fact, the person who was in there had welded themselves inside, and they had installed cameras on the outside so they could see where they were going. Terrified residents ran for cover and began calling 911. Over the next two hours, this homemade assault vehicle would go on a rampage, destroying 13 buildings, starting with the cement plant. After that, it turned around and went straight through the town hall, it turned and went through a bank, and then it went through the police station, and then the local newspaper, and then it also went through a local hardware store and the house of the former mayor. The police tried to box the bulldozer in using their biggest vehicles, but it just easily pushed them aside. SWAT team showed up and began engaging this vehicle with their largest caliber armor-piercing rounds, but none of them went through it. Finally, one of the treads on the bulldozer got stuck in a basement, and it kind of tilted the machine on its side, and it couldn't go anywhere. And then very shortly after that, the engine finally died. It would take authorities seven hours to finally cut through the armor of this killdozer. And when they looked inside, they found that Marvin was the one driving it, and he had taken his own life. Marvin had spent the past year and a half building up this bulldozer specifically so he could seek revenge on the zoning committee, as well as other town officials that he felt screwed him. Marvin was the only fatality, but before he died, he caused over $7 million in damages. Here are some real images of Marvin. Marvin's killdozer. On the evening of December 19th, 2016, 62-year-old Russian ambassador Andrei Karlov was ushered into a famous art museum in Turkey. There, Andrei was going to deliver a speech at the opening of an exhibition of Turkish photography that featured the Russian countryside. Andrei had been a Russian government employee for the past 40 years, spending much of his time in North Korea, but in 2013, he took this post as the ambassador to Turkey. Although he was a seasoned diplomat, he knew there was a lot riding on this visit. His appearance there was following several days 
days of protests by Turks against Russian involvement in the Syrian civil war. Andre was there to ease the strain in Turkish-Russian relations as officials from both countries met to broker a ceasefire in Syria. As Andre made his way across the room, he had a lot of things on his mind, but one thing he wasn't concerned about was his own safety. The museum had state-of-the-art security cameras and everyone who was going to be attending his speech had been carefully screened and vetted. Andre was also protected by his own personal bodyguards that were these men in dark suits that fanned out around him as he stepped up to the microphone. The bodyguard who stood directly behind him was 22-year-old Melvit Altintosh. He was a Turkish native who for two and a half years had served on an elite riot police unit and over the past year he had been asked eight separate times to be on the personal security detail of the Turkish president. Andre looked down at the podium at his notes and then he looked up at the room that was filled with journalists and dignitaries and he composed himself, he cleared his voice, and he began to speak. Behind him, Mevlet, the bodyguard, opened his jacket slightly and continued staring at the back of Andre's head. And then in one swift motion, he drew a pistol and fired three shots into the ambassador's back. And then when the ambassador fell to the ground, Mevlet moved on top of him and fired four more shots, killing him. Guests started screaming and running for cover. Meanwhile, Mevlet pointed his finger into the sky and yelled, do not forget Aleppo, do not forget Syria. And then he began walking around the exhibit, smashing the pictures on the wall before Turkish security forces showed up, there was a gunfight, and Mevlet was killed. It would turn out Mevlet was not a part of Andrei Karlov's security detail. He was actually off duty, but had used his police credentials to get into the exhibit hall. His exact motive for the assassination is unclear. Some think it was revenge for Russia's targeting of rebel-held areas in Aleppo. Others say the shooting was designed to disrupt warming relations between Turkey and Russia. But regardless of why it happened, what the world remembers from this event is the award-winning photograph that was taken of Mevlet immediately after he committed the attack. Here is that photo. In the fall of 2015, 21-year-old Otto Warmbier was a gifted student at the University of Virginia. He had a passion for seeing new and faraway places, and so one day when he was on campus and he saw an ad for a trip going to one of the most secretive places in the world, North Korea, he jumped at the opportunity to go. The tour was being run by a group called the Young Pioneers, whose slogan was, we take you to places that your mother would rather you stayed away from but they promised their tours were totally safe. Initially, Otto's parents were not too keen on the idea of their son going to North Korea, but when they saw how excited he was about going on this trip, they ultimately said, okay, we'll let you go. On December 29th, 2015, Otto met up with the other 10 members of this tour group at the airport. They all climbed inside of an old Soviet jet and they took off for North Korea. 15 hours later, they arrived at Pyongyang International Airport. And as soon as they got off the plane, the North Korean border police came right up to them confiscated their cameras, and then checked their phones for any subversive material. After a few tense minutes, they gave them their phones back and allowed them to leave. The group went straight to their hotel, and before they went inside, they noticed a clearly anti-American billboard right outside, and it made the group very uneasy because they were all American. But they collectively decided that this was just part of the experience and they shouldn't be worried or concerned about it. And before long, they had totally let their guard down and they were out enjoying the sights and sounds of the capital city. At one point, Otto and some others even got into a snowball fight with some North Korean children. By New Year's Eve, the group felt completely normal walking around North Korea. And so they headed to this huge party at Kim Il-sung Square with thousands of other North Koreans. And then after that was over, they headed back to their hotel and continued to drink. The hotel they were staying in was designed to entertain foreigners. In addition to their bar and five restaurants in the lobby, they had a massage parlor, a sauna, a bowling alley. I mean, this group was totally living it up. The following morning, which was the day of their departure from North Korea, Otto was one of the last people of the group to hand his passport to airport officials. And when he did, it seemed like they spent a lot of time looking at it and then looking at Otto and then talking to each other in Korean. And then at some point, two North Korean soldiers just appeared out of nowhere behind Otto, tapped him on the shoulder. Otto turned around and they grabbed him by the arm and led him away. The others from the group that saw this happen would say Otto didn't put up any resistance and didn't look scared. He just walked with them. Later, North Korea would release grainy CCTV footage taken from inside the hotel where Otto and the group was staying that showed this unidentifiable figure walking into a restricted area pulling a poster off of the wall. And the North Koreans were saying that figure was Otto. After taking Otto from the airport, North Korean officials said they found the poster that had been stolen in Otto's possession. And they accused him of a very serious crime in North Korea, 
which is damaging or stealing any item that has the picture or name of the North Korean leader on it. Otto was sent to jail and the rest of his group was told to leave. Two months later, on February 29th, the North Korean government released a video that showed Otto walking into a North Korean courtroom, his head is down and his hands are cuffed. They walk him into the center of the room and sit him down in front of this long table and he's looking out to the sea of reporters and courtroom officials and he proceeds to confess to his crime. The way he describes what he did is so bizarre that many people believe it was a forced confession scripted by his interrogators. Otto says he put on his quietest boots, the best for sneaking, and then snuck his way into the hotel where he stole the poster. He claimed a local Methodist church, a university's secret society, and the American administration all collectively pushed him to do this. He said his actions were intentionally designed to hurt the work ethic and motivation of the Korean people. And he also said he was impressed with the North Korean government's humanitarian treatment of himself, considering he was a severe criminal. And then after his nearly two minute long confession, he stands up and bows to the court and then appears to break character and begs for forgiveness. And he's quickly ushered out. A month later, the North Korean court would convict Otto and sentence him to 15 years of hard labor. But after 17 months of intense political pressure, North Korea agreed to release Otto and send him back to the United States. Now, to this point, nobody had had a chance to communicate with Otto while he was in prison. And so when he was sent back, he was not the same Otto. He had suffered some unexplained head injury and was in a coma. When Otto's parents saw him for the first time, they barely recognized him. They said it looked like his lower teeth had been moved around with pliers, and they found a large scar on his foot that they didn't recognize. North Korea denied any intentional mistreatment of Otto. They said he fell into this coma after contracting botulism, which is a very rare form of food poisoning that can be deadly. Once Otto was back under American medical care, doctors did everything they could to try to get him out of this coma, but there was nothing they could do. He was in a persistent vegetative state and he had already suffered severe brain damage. And so on June 19th, 2017, just six days after Otto was back in the United States, his parents made the heartbreaking decision to remove him from life support and he died shortly thereafter. To this day, no one really knows what actually happened to Otto. Here is one of the final photos of Otto while he was still alive and healthy, taken right after his strange confession. He's holding back tears and begging for mercy, but mercy would not come. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please offer to house sit for the like button. And when you're there, split all of their two ply toilet paper into one ply. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts, where I post random short videos. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.